This is the 300th episode of the Preacher Boys podcast, and let's just say a lot has happened since episode one of the show. From having a seat with Chris Hansen, to protesting with Paris Hilton, to being a part of the four-part documentary series Let Us Pray, which hit number seven on HBO Max, this show has led me places that I never could have imagined. On today's episode, I want to take just a few minutes to break down some of my favorite memories from the show. I was looking back at my first episode. I was 24 when I shared that initial episode of the Preacher Boys podcast back in January of 2020, which feels like forever ago. And I just want to say thank you to everybody, whether you've been there from day one and you got to listen to me stumbling through those early episodes, trying to find my voice, or whether you're someone who just started listening recently after watching a series like Let Us Pray or hearing me on another podcast like Cults to Consciousness or A Little Bit Culty, however you found this show, the fact you're listening means a lot to me. The truth is doing this show has not always been easy. There's been plenty of times it's been emotionally overwhelming. Plenty of times late at night I'm crying and I want to quit doing the show. Plenty of times I've gotten aggressive comments, mean feedback, or even threats in my inboxes. Plenty of times I've had conversations that are frustrating, harrowing, terrifying, or all of the above. But overall, this podcast has meant a lot of healing, it has meant a lot of empowerment, it has meant really finding my voice personally, and I hope it's meant those things for everybody who's tuned in so far. I was looking at some stats for the show just a couple days ago, and I was blown away when I realized that the Preacher Boys YouTube channel has over 3.5 million views. The podcast is not too far behind it, with over 2.5 million downloads to date. And I really hope that's just the beginning. I hope that the messages that are shared on the show, from the brave survivors to the experts that I bring on the show to all the other talking heads that you hear throughout the course of the Preacher Boys podcast— will inspire survivors to find their own voices and to find healing, whatever that looks like for them. Like I said, on this episode, I want to spend some time really diving into some favorite memories from the show. And first and foremost, I want to break down three of the expert interviews that really stood out to me personally. Again, it's almost impossible to rate or rank any of these, so I'm not going to. These are just three that as I look back on 300 episodes, these three specific interviews with experts really, really resonated with me. And I, I feel incredibly lucky because in addition to interviewing survivors who are sharing their stories bravely, often for the first time through the podcast, I also get to sit down and get an education from experts in fields of everything from trauma recovery, history, social science, narcissism, and so much more. So this this show for me has been a bit of a masterclass in really getting to understand a variety of topics on a level I never had before. So here are three interviews with experts that really mean a lot to me personally in no particular order. First and foremost, I have to mention Chris Hansen. Chris Hansen is an absolute legend. Anyone who flipped channels in the early 2000s would inevitably stumble across episodes of To Catch a Predator. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC, and we're doing a story on adults who try to meet kids online. <laughs> oh, no, please, sir. With his trademark humor to his ability to make would-be predators squirm in deliriously entertaining ways, no one has ever done it quite like Chris. Needless to say, I leapt at the chance to meet him in person while he was visiting Las Vegas in 2023. I was invited by my friend Travis Chappell to co-host the interview for his podcast, Travis Makes Friends. One of the highlights of my conversation with Chris Hansen was when he broke down the origins of To Catch a Predator. Check it out. Well, I was always interested in investigative crime type stories, um, enterprise stories, uh, things where we employed hidden cameras. And so when I learned about this online watchdog group, Perverted Justice, um, I started to think if we could use their ability to be decoys online and our ability at the network to wire a house with hidden cameras and microphones, it could be pretty compelling. So at the time, Perverted Justice would put decoys in the chat rooms, and if an adult approached one of the decoys posing as a 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old kid, obvious profile, and there was a sexual liaison plan, they would post this person's picture and identity on the website. Mm. Well, we took it a step further. We created a scenario where we would come face-to-face -face with this potential child predator and confront them. So we did so in Bethpage, Long Island, and I was driving out there, and I wondered, you know, did we just blow tens of thousands of dollars of yeah. the network's money and nobody is going to show up, mm. which is always, you know, Potential. if it was easy, everybody could do it, sure. you know. Mm. So we didn't partner or collaborate with law enforcement for that or the second investigation. And 
you know, I'm driving out there and my producer calls and says, where the hell are you? We've got two guys scheduled in 45 minutes. And, you know, two and a half days later, 17 guys had surfaced in that investigation, oh including goodness. a New York City firefighter. So the story, Oof. the show kind of sat at the network for a minute. Yeah. And people were in the executive ranks trying to figure out, okay, what do we do? How do we do it? You know, this is obviously phenomenally compelling material. I mean, stuff that has never been seen on television before. How do we do it? And I remember being in a meeting, and we shot this in February 2004. Now we're in late summer, early fall, and I'm sort of pushing to get this on TV. Yeah. And a, an executive looks at me and says, I just don't know how to promote it. And I, much to the shock of everybody in the room, I said, you know how to promote this? Here's how you promote it. There's a man on your back porch with his penis in his hand and he wants to stick it in your daughter tonight we're going to tell you how to prevent that from happening i don't remember that tv spot no there wasn't it wasn't a spot but i was so frustrated at not getting it on the air yeah that that's right. basically it's like let me be as blunt as possible be, yeah here. And like, i did it, i did it i did it for yeah. shock value marketing piece yeah and so you know everybody's looking at me like hansen's finally lost his mind <laughs> and, 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 and there was a so collective yeah. yeah there was a collective i mean everybody was on i'm, I'm being you know sarcastic here and facetious yeah. for, to make a point, but everybody sort of understood, okay, let, it's time. Sure. Yeah. We're, we're going to do the best we can with this material. It's, you know, pushes the boundaries of yeah. what you can put on primetime television. It's a proceed with caution. And, so there, there, and yeah. there was a real, there was a legitimate concern. I, people weren't trying to hush it up or cover it up or anything. I don't, yeah. didn't mean to insinuate that. Everybody w wanted this to go on TV. And so we did it. And it had quite a quite a response, and so we did it again. And the third time, we collaborated with law enforcement. And you know, some of the cases were prosecuted in the first two investigations, but at the end of the day, these guys would walk out the door. And so it wasn't really the most socially responsible way to proceed. Mm -hmm. And from a television production standpoint, it was rather unfulfilling to see these guys walk away, mm -hmm. even though in some of the cases they were later prosecuted. So we did from then on, and. Up until, you know, including the new investigations we're doing now as we speak, we collaborate with law enforcement. Mm. And it's the only responsible way to do it, really. Just re-listening to that interview with Chris Hansen makes me want to go back down the To Catch a Predator rabbit hole on YouTube, watching highlights from the show. I really appreciated this interview. And again, Chris Hansen's an absolute legend. Uh, when you talk about catching predators, he's one of the first names that comes to mind. He's easily memeable. He's hilarious. He's really intelligent. And uh, he really opened the conversation around predators in a big, unprecedented way through a really unique format. And so uh, I really appreciate that interview with Chris Hansen. But instead of going down the rabbit hole of more To Catch a Predator clips, let me go ahead and talk about the second person on my list. And that is Kristen Dumay. Kristen Dumay is a New York Times bestselling author. She is a professor at Calvin University. And she wrote the book, Jesus and John Wayne, which is absolutely fantastic. It talks about the intersection between religion and politics in the United States. And I have to tell you, it was early on in the course of the show. I believe I interviewed her in 2020. And reading Kristen Umay's book, I realized how brilliant she was. And I legitimately was terrified sitting down for that interview that I would not be able to keep up with her intellectually. And so I read her entire book. I listened to the audio book. I listened to talks that she gave about the book. I was reading blog articles that she had written, and I ended up writing five pages of notes for that episode with a bunch of different questions so I would not get lost at any point in the conversation. I was overly prepared, and I know I'm biased, but I think it paid off because the episode came out incredibly. Here's a highlight from my conversation with Kristen Dumay. Evangelicals didn't totally disappear after the Scopes trial in the 1920s. Uh, they just didn't maintain control of certain large denominations, but that didn't stop them. They started their own denominations. They started their own independent churches. They started their Bible institutes and, and, you know, across the country. And it was in the early forties that they came together and said, okay, we're doing all of these amazing things. Just think what we could do if we band together. Mm. 
and and they had a plan right in the early in the early 40s with the National Association of Evangelicals they knew what they wanted to do yeah. they said we need organizations that are going to link all of these these institutions and we need magazines with tens of thousands of subscribers and we need radio and then very soon after that we need television right to reach into all of the corners of this country and they did exactly that it's really uncanny if you kind of look at their plans and then with the help of Billy Graham and, and everything he was able to to pull together they, they achieved this um, and so this was uh, in the 1950s that we see this coming together and somewhat stunningly already by the 1950s and with the help of Billy Graham conservative evangelicals are wielding power on the national stage in the White House with Eisenhower. And, and so very quickly, they, they moved to the center of things um, from a, a feeling like they were on the fringes, you know, post scopes trial, that they were kind of um, just scattered. Then they made these plans and then within 10 years, look at them, it was amazing. Um, and then if that 1950s is where you, you kind of uh, start, then you can see how by the 1960s and by the 1970s, they feel re-marginalized. They mm -hmm. feel like they are no longer at the center of things. This consensus moment has kind of started to unravel. The consensus was only ever with certain white middle class right, Americans, mm -hmm. not, not a whole consensus. But uh, you can see where their, their sense of displacement came from. But that's a very short historical framework um, to be working from. Oh. But that's where the sense of nostalgia tends to go back to, right? We want those days again, or what we think those days were like. Seriously, if you've never read Jesus and John Wayne, pick up a copy of Kristen's book as soon as possible. You will not regret it. It is an important, important resource for those trying to understand politics and religion and how those two have intersected in American culture. But speaking of books that have had a big impact, one of the ones I have to mention is Combating Cult Mind Control. I read this very early on, I think a few months before I launched the Preacher Boys podcast. And it was one of those books I was sitting down and reading and then switched to listening to because I was doing a big road trip up to Vegas at the time. And I just remember listening to Combating Cult Mind Control and all the things that Dr. Stephen Hassan was laying out in the book really just made me go, is this book about me? <laughs> and I know I'm not alone in that experience. I know that it's been a go-to book for so many people that have left high control environments. And so from day one of doing the podcast, when I made a list of some experts I wanted to talk to on the show, this third person was on the list, and that is Dr. Stephen Hassan. Dr. Stephen Hassan was my white whale for the show. He was somebody that I reached out to way back when, back in 2020, and wasn't able to actually get an interview on the calendar until 2024. I was back and forth with his team. I was I was sending pitches constantly. I was being as persistent as I could. Uh, what my friend Travis says is professionally persistent, uh, as persistent as I could be without being annoying. And I'm so thankful that I was finally able to get the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Stephen Hassan and conduct this interview with him. Uh, it really meant a lot to me. And again, it was something where it's one thing to read a book that really transforms the way you think about just everything, the way you look at uh, high control groups, the way you look at thought terming cliches, the way you look at manipulation and coercion. And it's another thing to be able to sit down with the author of that book and really ask all the questions that are flooding through your mind as a reader to the author themselves to get more clarity. And I really, really enjoy that conversation. One of my favorite things in the conversation was getting to talk to Dr. Hassan about his own personal faith experience because he often writes about, you know, growing up in cultish environments. But I wanted to talk to him about the religious uh, practices that he explores now, specifically with his Jewish faith. And I think he gave some really interesting perspectives on religion that I think to a fundamentalist are pretty shocking, but I think are also really beautiful. And, you know, while I don't agree with, necessarily everything that Dr. Stephen Hassan would believe, obviously. Uh, that's not my personal expressions of what spirituality looks like at this point. Uh, I really found it enlightening and beautiful, and I appreciate him sharing a little bit of his journey with me. So here's that part of the conversation with Dr. Stephen Hassan. And I'm curious because you are still religious in some sense, and I know you've gone into detail about the healthy version of that that you experience now. Uh, I put myself in a position now, I have no idea what religious 
living or spirituality means to me in this current stage. But the way that you perceive religion for yourself, do you find that you get more benefit from the object of your belief? So what you're believing in and the the being that you ascribe to, or do you just acknowledge that it's the power of me believing in this, that I'm finding some kind of fulfillment by just picking this system and aligning with it? And that kind of evolutionary advantage of religion to you, where does it sit for you? Like, where does that, where does that kind of rest in terms of your experience? Yes. With religion? Another, another deep question there, Eric. The thing is, is I think of myself more as spiritually minded than religious because I'm not strictly observant. I believe in the idea of Shabbat as a 25 hour period where you disconnect from world and making money and worrying about politics and just sleeping and eating and studying and having sex if you're lucky enough to have a partner um, and restoring your batteries. I love the idea of Shabbat. Do I practice it every Shabbat? I wish, but I, it's more of an ideal. I do it sometimes, but I'm frequently needing to do work-related things on a, on a Shabbat. I also belong to a progressive community, and the rabbi that I credit for bringing me back to identify as a Jew was a comedian and a scholar, and he would tell jokes on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, and he would be telling jokes from the from the front. And that's the kind of rabbi I want. And by the way, the word rabbi is teacher. It's not like a, an elevated post. I mean, people who are wise, you elevate them because you look to them for wisdom. But and we're, my my community is cherishes questions, not telling people how to behave. It's not about guilt tripping you if you're if you're uh, not wearing a talit or you mispronounce or miss sing a song or whatever. And if I wasn't born Jewish and didn't have Orthodox grandparents on my mother's side, I may not be identifying as a, a Jew. But what I like about the Judaism I believe in is it's this notion that we have a purpose in our life. It's to make the world better. It's to we'll call it tikkun olam or repairing the world. We, we aspire to look at the world as an integrated whole, as we believe the divine is, uh, as opposed to fragments. I definitely do not anthropomorphize the divine as a man or a, a Zeus-like you know, figure with a beard, with a judgment. If, if, and if I had to put a label on my faith, I think the technical term for it is panentheonism, which simply described is believing that there's divinity in everything, <laughs> in all living things and an inanimate things. Um, and do I think there's an afterlife? No idea. Uh, Jews do not, at least the ones I hang out with, are not wanting to get a goody brownie point yeah. so that we are in a good place in the next life. We're about what we can do now. And, and when it comes to helping others, we're obliged to help, not because we feel like it, because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, if we see a, a log in front of a blind person and that you know they're going to trip, you're obliged to warn the person or walk them around it. It's that kind of uh, community. And and the thing about Judaism is it, you really need to worship together. It's a community yeah. thing. There's a thing called minions. So you need 10 people to, together to pray, pray properly. Uh, there's so many rituals that I like. I like the, the, the studying of Torah. I've been doing it whenever I can on Shabbat for 26 years now. And I, and, and, and by no means 
is a taught as an inerrant document. In fact, I don't know if you've ever read Friedman's uh, book, Who Wrote the Bible, but mm. the the Torah is written in four distinct voices, and 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 the stories are cobbled together because yeah. it was an oral tradition. So it's anything but the inerrant word of God that you can't challenge. And there are centuries of rabbinic arguments about what is the meaning of this verse. And and the Talmudic books are include both positions. And and again, the idea is to question, not to believe blindly anything. Yeah. So those are the things that resonate for me to be a good person to aspire to feel my life has meaning and purpose. Jews are very big on education because we were persecuted, so we often would have to pack up quickly and leave, but you, you take your knowledge with you. And lastly, I'll just say the central story of the Jews is, is liberation from Pharaoh and and enslavement and it's a it's a metaphor that really is apt for former cult members of like it's scary to go out into the desert we have at least you know a known familiar you know yes we're tortured and we have to work hard but at least we know what's happening it's the devil you know not the devil you don't kind of yeah, yeah, and 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 but it's a central uh you know Passover is going to be coming up and one of the central points of telling the story is you want to remember you were a slave. So you want to identify with all oppressed people no matter what form of slavery they're in. And for me this is a a teaching about empathy. Like if you can put yourself in the shoes of slaves, then you can empathize for what their reality is like. Mm. And so I think there's a real value in that. So for those reasons and cultural reasons, I identify as a Jew. And let me state categorically that I'm against religious extremism in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. And I abhor religious extremists who say, I'm not Jewish because I'm not observant enough and I don't have paces and I don't wear a black hat or whatever. No. Uh, I abhor that. I, I, we have a female conservatively ordained rabbi and they don't see her as legitimate as a real no. rabbi. And uh, I can't relate to that. And that's who's running Israel right now. And I'm so upset. No. Not good. And with that, those are three of the expert guests I've had on the show that have meant a ton to me since doing the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm curious to know, what are your favorite guests that I've had on the show? What are some of the experts that have said things, written things that have really meant a lot to you? I would love to hear it. Drop in the comments, post on social and tag me. would love to know if you've checked out a book that's been referred on the show, if you checked out a course, a resource, uh, whatever's been most helpful to you. Now, in addition to interviewing a lot of incredible people, I've also gotten to read a lot of incredible books. And so I want to highlight three of my favorite books that I've read since starting the Preacher Boys podcast. Number one, I'll just mention it quickly, even though I just talked about the author of this book, who I also interviewed, it's Jesus and John Wayne, written by the incredible Kristen Dumais. This book is absolutely phenomenal. I think it's a must read for anybody who grew up within evangelicalism as a whole, but especially in fundamentalism. Uh, it is a real eye opener for sure. And so many things that I took for granted uh, were really broken down and explained in this book in ways that I just, I mean, you just have to pick up a copy of the book. It's its absolutely fantastic. It's a must read. And it would probably, if I do the show for another 300 episodes, this will probably still sit in my top three book list. It is absolutely phenomenal. The next book I want to talk about is Unspeakable by Jessica Willis Fisher. You might recognize her from the short-lived TLC series called The Willis Family. You might recognize her from her incredible music, but Jessica just wrote one of the most beautiful, harrowing, touching, just raw memoirs about what it was like growing up in an abusive home. And uh, this is a book that was incredibly hard to read, uh, but incredibly necessary and beautiful. And she just shares her story with so much honesty and shows herself to be such an incredible, resilient, and powerful person. 
And so being able to read her book was absolutely incredible. I, I mean, huge trigger warning. She includes one in the book, but it is a very heavy read. But again, I think a very beautiful and just powerful read. And uh, so that that book definitely sits in my top three that I've read since starting the show. And I highly, highly recommend it. It is absolutely fantastic. And I also encourage you to check out the interview I did with Jessica on the Preacher Boys podcast. Uh, we had a great conversation kind of following up on the book. So uh, go grab a copy of Unspeakable. That one definitely is high up there on the list. And last but not least, I don't have a physical copy to show you, but I do want to mention the book Corruptible by Dr. Brian Kloss. My friend Joe Tyndall actually recommended this book to me, and it is a fantastic book about why really bad people crave power, how they get power, and why they're so good at keeping power. And it really opened my eyes to understanding how systems can draw in corrupt leadership, even when the system itself is well-intentioned. And again, Dr. Kloss is just one of those minds that just operates on a different level. And uh, I absolutely loved his perspectives that he shared both in his book and on his episode of the Preacher Boys podcast, where we got to go a little bit deeper. So I definitely have to mention that one as well. I've shared a little bit about three favorite expert guest interviews that I've had on the show, and I've talked a little bit about three books that have really impacted me while doing the Preacher Boys podcast. But I also want to look forward to the future a little bit and talk about three of my dream guests for the show. I don't know if I'm mentioning these just to get people thinking or to be able to have a record to say that I wanted to do it for when it happens, or if I'm just speaking into the universe, hoping that this will somehow manifest itself or that some person will hear this and connect me with the right person. But these are three people I would absolutely love to talk to on the show. Uh, number one is Leah Remini. She is obviously the Scientology whistleblower who you've probably seen on A&E's series on Scientology. She hosts a podcast with Mike Rinder about Scientology and just her advocacy work uh, is really, really inspiring to me. I love her personality of the way that she gets down and dirty and really brawls with these cults. And so I would love to have Leah Remini on the show at some point. She's absolutely fantastic. In fact, my friend Ashley Easter, who I work alongside at the nonprofit Courage 365, did get to interview Leah Remini at one of her events. And I'll link to that in the show notes of this episode. I'm really, really jealous of that conversation, uh, but I'm really proud of her for getting to have it. Leah Remini has been someone, of course, I've wanted to talk to since day one of the show. This next one that I'm going to mention is somebody that's really developed pretty recently into someone I have to get on the show at some point, and that is Olivia Plath from Welcome to Plathville. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because I've done a couple episodes recently kind of exploring why she's such a fascinating figure to me in the world of fundamentalism and reality TV, and I'll link to those in the show notes of this episode. But I'm really hoping in some way that conversation could happen in the next year or so. I would love to be able to go a little bit deeper into her origins in fundamentalism and her exploration and journey out. She's someone who, as I watched the series Welcome to Plathville, I really resonated with her character, the thought processes, the way that she's exploring and deconstructing her faith. And I would love to have a conversation with her. And lastly, and again, this is somebody who's really been on my radar for a minute for a variety of reasons, is Rain Wilson. Uh, Rain Wilson, you might know as Dwight from The Office, but he also recently has been doing, I shouldn't even say recently, he's been doing this for years now, uh, is he explores a lot of conversations about spirituality. And I would really love to talk to him about his new book and podcast, Soul Boom, uh, which I've been listening to the first episode of the podcast. I've been watching a lot of his clips, reading a lot of his uh, materials, and then listening to him on a lot of podcasts talking about spirituality and religion. And I think we just have a really interesting conversation just approaching um, you know, what spirituality can look like outside the confines of strict fundamentalist religion. And so I think that'd be a great conversation. I honestly don't want to spend hours talking about The Office. I'd love to talk about um, just spirituality and what that really means to him and the conversations that he's had on his show um, so far in that initial episode with Rick Glassman um, and then all the shows he's been on as a guest have been so good. And I would love to just be able to sit in on a conversation like that and be able to ask some questions following up on some of his thoughts. So uh, those are some of the names that I would love to get on the show. And I want to close out the episode, you know, beyond guests, beyond um, highlights of episodes beyond, you know, 
documentaries and things that bring exposure and awareness, which I think is important. Um, you know, one of the big desires I have moving forward is really boots on the ground activism. Um, and I think some of that means more in-person protests and things like that. But again, that's more awareness. I think the big next step for myself as a person who is running this podcast and is building this platform is to start leveraging the platform more and more into making real change through legislation. And when I sat down to write the outline for this episode, you know, I was writing down three favorite guests, three favorite books, three moments, three dream guests, you know, that sort of thing. But one of the things that's really, really meaningful to me and important to me is to be doing some things with that platform, with the the audience that's there and really driving change through legislation itself. And so um, I'm having some conversations the last couple of months about what that looks like and where I can start directing you know, attention to different laws and to different things that allow loopholes for, you know, abusive clergy, uh, things that affect the the mandated reporting laws, statute of limitations, and really making lists of things that I can attack head on, whether collecting signatures from the audience that has grown here, whether that is me flying different places and meeting with different politicians to make uh, really meaningful conversations happen that could affect the course of decisions that are made within those governmental bodies. Um, I just really want to see some actual legislative change start taking place that closes the amount of loopholes that there are for, again, mandated clergy reporting, for such limitations to be removed in areas where it's prohibiting justice from taking place. Uh, I I really want to start pursuing that kind of stuff really regularly. So If you want to keep up to date with that stuff, just be sure to be following over on social media. And of course, I'll be covering it here on the show. But I just want to say again, thank you so much to all of you who have made the last 300 episodes so special. I am growing alongside the show over the last four or five years now, and it is just really beautiful to see the impact the show has had thus far. And it's really exciting to see the impact that it could have in actually making real change moving forward. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Preacher Boys podcast. Here is to 300 more.